Let's um, invite Pastor Steve right now to bring God's word. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank so you much. very much. Steve. <laughs> Bless, Bless you. you. It's lovely to see uh, 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 Pastor Henry and Rachel on um, real person rather than Zoom. We for two years it feels like we've mostly seen them on Zoom, and uh, and so to be in person is beautiful. And to be here with you has been a real privilege and a real joy. And Father, we, here we are at the end of what has been a pretty full uh, weekend. Thursday in prayer, Friday with leaders from around the city and then the encounter night. Yesterday with some of the home church leaders, this morning with much of the church family. And here we are again this evening, Lord, and I thank you that there is fresh manna available from you for us. I thank you that you always have good things in store for those who come to you. Thank you that that's your promise, that those who seek you will find what you have for them. And we come hungry. We, we come for more. And Holy Spirit, I pray that you would feed people this afternoon. Even in the next few minutes, would you awaken our hearts? Would you seal up inside of us what you've been doing? Would you bring alignment to thoughts and revelation and understanding? And Lord, the sense I get on this afternoon gathering, the final gathering of our time together for this weekend... I feel like you want to seal things up and set us on our feet looking the right way. And so I pray that this, this next 20, 30 minutes, however long we have, would just be the Holy Spirit putting his arms around us, straightening our shoulders, lifting up our head, and, and, and the charge of the Spirit for what you're calling us to do. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So there's a lot of words that have been spoken over the last few days. And uh, I'm, I'm like, Lord, I don't want to just give more information. I would love it to be that you come and that you will pull the family together and that you would seal into us what you're wanting to accomplish. So that's my desire. And the title I've given to this afternoon's session is just simply come up come up. We've heard a lot of words. There's been good revelation. You are on a great journey as a church that is a family of churches. And even in that strap line, a, a, you know, a new life, a family of churches, it's inherent then that there's reproduction in your DNA, that you are not only good when you're gathered, you are good when you're going. It's gathering and going. It's gathered and scattered. And we become the salt and the light of all that God has called us to be. For a long time, many churches have been good at gathering. But you know, if we only have an inflow and we don't have an outflow, we become like the Dead Sea. It has an inflow, but it has no outflow. So there's no fish, there's no life in the Dead Sea. And many believers' lives are like that, feed me, feed me, give to me, but they have no outflow and they become dead, swampy. And, and the Lord wants his people and his church, yes, have a beautiful flow of the Spirit, have a beautiful inflow of what God is doing, but have a matching outflow. If the Lord finds people like that, he will give them the best inflow so that they have good outflow. I think for too long we've been focused on what we can get instead of what we can give. And so as we take into mind everything that the Lord has been saying this last few days, I'm going to give you an application right at the end of this message, which is really an invitation from God to come up. We'll get to that in just a moment. Some of these verses I've read over the last few days, and I'm going to read them again. How many people have not been in any of the services 
of the last three days. Just wave at me. Okay, so beautiful. You're here. You're going to hear this pull together for you. Habakkuk 2.14, it's a promise, it's a prophecy, and it still stands today. Uh, I really believe the Bible is not just uh, a, a good book. Even the prophecies that were made in Scripture, they've been spoken out by the prophets under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, and they are still going out over the earth, and they will produce a harvest. And this prophecy from Habakkuk, the prophet, says the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Habakkuk is saying there's coming a day that the whole earth would come under the knowledge of God. At the moment, you walk down your street and most people are not aware of the knowledge of God. They're not aware of God, the living God. You walk into work, that's not the narrative or conversation. You go into school or university, the predominant conversation is not around God. But there is coming a day, because this prophecy will come true, that the, the earth itself will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of God. Just as the waters cover the sea, so the, the, the conversation, the general narrative, the awareness of people about God is going to increase. We are not, you've got to believe this because it's biblical, not because I'm saying it. We're not on the back foot hoping something will change. We are holding on to promise knowing that God will bring the transformation that's needed. It is coming. It will happen. And throughout history, there have been moments when a town or a village or a city suddenly awakens and the knowledge of God is prevalent. We call those moments revival. It might have happened in the Hebrides in 1949 to 1953. And all of a sudden, those islands started to wake up that there's a God. And you hear the stories in I think it was Baravas, one of the aisles, that a meeting was closing in a church. It was 11 p.m. at night. Most of the villagers had already gone to bed, and this church was in the middle of nowhere, and yet they'd been crying out for God to come. And all of a sudden, as they opened the church doors, there's like 300 people out there. Like, I mean, you're talking 1949. There was no... Advertising, there was nothing going on. It was, everybody had gone to bed. What happened was the weightiness of God started to descend on cottages, on farms, in, in, in those mills where weavers lived. And all of a sudden, they had the urge. The only thing they knew to do, we feel something eternal, we better go to chapel. These were people who were not at the meeting. And yet the Lord was stirring. This is how the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord. The Lord changes the conversation, raises the awareness. We are living with that expectation. No matter how clever we are at doing church, it is not enough to meet the need of the hour. Our strategies, our great oratory will not meet the need of the hour. Only God can meet the need of the hour. There's going to be one that's glorified. There's going to be one that is seen. There is one man upon the throne and it's him. As he begins to move, he's going to awaken the earth to who he is. We're seeing sprinklings of this right now. I hear stories and testimonies of people in refugee camps in Sudan or in Afghanistan or wherever in the Middle East and they have a vision of the man in white. What is it? It's Jesus appearing, letting them know who he is and awakening them to the knowledge of who God is. It's going to increase. It's going to grow. Um, and it's going to happen in our day. The Lord prophesied through Isaiah, the prophet in Isaiah 44 and verse 3, he said, for I will pour water on thirsty land and streams on the dry ground. I will pour out my spirit on your offspring and my blessing on your descendants. 
you could change some of the language and talk about Normanton, you could talk about Derby, you could talk about Derbyshire, you could talk about it spreading throughout the UK. I will pour my water in this area and on on my streams on dry ground. I don't know if you look around here, is there dry ground? Is there a need? He said, I'm going to pour water out where there's thirst and streams will begin to flow where there is dry ground. I will pour out my spirit on your offspring, your children, and my blessing on your descendants. I I, I want us to be awakened to what God is about to do. We're going to be convinced of this. You're working your job. You're paying your bills. You're looking after your family. Maybe you're battling your demons. You know that phrase, things inside of you that you don't like? And as Roger was stood here, he said, I have the capability of doing this or this. We all do. We all battle stuff on the inside. And here I am this evening telling you, God's going to move one day. And you're like, yeah, I've got enough challenge just to pay the mortgage or to meet my rent or I need to find a new property to let because my landlord is being difficult or whatever your challenge might be. I want to say to the midst of it, God is aware of all of that, but these promises still stand true today. And you were born into this generation to be a part of what God is doing. He's not going to move in isolation to his people. This is a move of God through the people of God. Now, I said to you, just us by ourselves is not enough, but we are not by ourselves And for too long, the church has been trying in her own strength. I'm still in my introduction, but you're safe with me because I also want to get home. (laughs) I've been away since Thursday morning. So you've got a preacher who's aware of time, but you've also got a preacher. And I'm telling you, as I'm stood here, I sense the Holy Spirit saying, as I speak, into the atmosphere here, not just here in this building, but here in this, if there's a spiritual atmosphere, what I'm declaring, the the spiritual forces hear it. Just about three minutes ago, as I'm preaching and declaring, I'm like, God, I don't care if anybody in the room's hearing, I'm preaching to the principalities, I'm preaching to the powers. The earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord, hallelujah. We need to, in faith, declare what God is said, His Word says, and what He will do. And some of you won't get what I'm saying right now, but it is going into your spirit, and it will produce a harvest in you. You might feel weary. You might feel like, I don't know if I'm even a part of this. I feel so tired, and there's so many challenges. Well, the Lord is taking the seed of His Word, and it's coming in, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to provoke you in the days to come. It's going to reap a harvest inside of you by God's grace. Amen. Ephesians 5, 14 to 17, the Apostle Paul telling the church in Ephesus, wake up, sleeper, rise from the dead. Christ will shine on you. Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Wow. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. You and I are here for more than just paying the rent, looking after the family, putting some savings aside, reaching out for a slightly maybe better, I don't know what you're believing for. Is it a better car? Is it just food on the table? You know, you want a new jacket? You wanted a better model phone? I don't know what you're reaching for. Maybe a nicer holiday one day. And the Lord is saying, there's more. It's not just about that. And he would come in the midst of it and says, wake up. Wake up. Christ will rise on you. Be very careful how you live. Not as unwise, but as wise. Make the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. And don't be foolish, but understand what God's will is. I pray that you would understand what God's will is. Pray that you would see why you are here. And Pastor Henry read this from Isaiah 60. 
Arise, shine, for your light has come. And the glory of the Lord rises upon you. See, darkness covers the earth, and thick darkness is over the peoples, but the Lord rises upon you. It's it's really a, a challenge to a change of posture. Arise, shine, for your light has come. And I, I would say to you, I don't want to make it dramatic, but it's true, that the Lord would say, it's time for you to arise and shine, for your light has come. You were born for such a time. It's, it's time to change posture, because God's glory rises upon you. Let me give you three stories that you need to be aware of. I'll give them to you in just one moment. But Proverbs 29 and verse 18, in the message translation, it says, if people can't see what God is doing, they stumble all over themselves. But when they attend to what he reveals, they are most blessed. If people can't see what God is doing, they stumble. Can you see what God is doing? I'm declaring to you in the last 10 minutes what God is doing. I'm telling you, he's about to move on the earth in an unprecedented way. Things are being aligned. He's preparing his church. In Isaiah 22 and verse 22, he actually says to a man called Shebna, I'm going to remove you from your position and I'm going to put in place a man called Eliakim because Shebna had started to love his power, love his position, love his prestige, had become proud, was no longer serving the purpose of God or the people of God. And the Lord said, I'm moving him out of the way and I'm going to put my anointing and give the keys to a man called Eliakim because he's a father and he's a servant. And that transition is, is, is happening in the West right now, in the church. The Lord is putting some to one side and he's raising others up. How many know the Lord opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble? We are in the midst of one of the biggest transitions in the church ever. Honestly, it's a shaking, it's a reforming, there's an exposing, and it's not just the devil at work here. The Father himself is cleaning house, and he's cleaning house in preparation for what he's about to do. And this Proverbs 29, verse 18, in the message, if people can't see what God is doing, they'll stumble. You have to be able to see what God is doing. Pray it with me right now. Father, help me see what you are doing. Help me to see what you are doing in Jesus' name. I may well have said this here before, but I haven't been for a while, so it's worth repeating. Every one of us is living a story, and there's three stories that we need to become convinced of. One is God's story. The second one is to know your story. And the third one is to know your community, your tribe's story. God's story, your story, our story. We're not living isolated to those stories. Hollywood is trying to tell you stories. Facebook and Instagram and Apple and Google all trying to tell you stories. Advertising telling you stories. Everybody's trying to get you to buy into a narrative. And in the midst of it, Proverbs 20, 19, if you can't see what God is doing, you'll stumble. In other words, God has written a story. He's written a big story. We call it the mission of God. And then there are smaller stories like yours and mine. And then there are community stories. My story and yours fits inside of a community story. The community story fits inside of God's big story. But if I don't know what my story is, and I don't know what God's story is, and I don't know my community story, 
I will live a life that everybody else around me tells me I should be living. That's why you got Christians living with Western materialistic entertainment-based values. They're living just like the world, but they're in the church. And the Lord is saying, can I give you a different story? Can I give you an eternal picture? Don't believe the stories they're telling you. I have a story for you. Amen? Amen. But because we've been raised, our parents have told us things. On the playground, we hear things. In the tea room at work, we hear things. In the classroom, we hear all the time people are telling you a story. My prayer is that you would, you would hear the story that God is writing. And you'd give yourself to that. Don't believe even your own narrative, like just telling yourself one. Find out what God is saying. Find out what your tribe is running with. And in the midst of that, you'll discover who you are and where you fit. Yeah. There's a lot of independence and isolation, normally because people have not learned to connect to their tribal story. New life is a tribe. I actually believe you're an apostolic family. And you're part of an apostolic family. And it just, apostolic is just, we're sent ones. And, and the Lord is raising up his church to become these resource places that are going to help resource from the kingdom out to the world. Yeah. They're going to keep training, sending, releasing. Uh, Jerusalem was an apostolic center. Ephesus was an apostolic center. Um, um, Antioch was an apostolic center. And I believe God is raising you up from being just a church gathered in a building to being a church family that is on a mission for the kingdom and being sent out. And your reach, as you're faithful in the little, your reach will grow. And your, your skill will grow. The weightiness of the grace on your house will grow. As roots go deep and people learn to pray, as people remove mixture from their lives because they see God's big story and they, and they buy into his story, it, all of it, imagine it, not just one person praying or two people praying. How about 100 people committed to a life of prayer? How about 500 or 1,000 that live a sacrificial life and they are working with the Holy Spirit to see the mixture removed? The power of that joint community story, you become an unstoppable force. On my own? Well, no matter how great I become, I'm just on my own. You put me in a community. We learn to hold each other steady. And then you'll see communities like this connected to communities like us in Wolverhampton. There's others in Portsmouth. There's others in London. We're all part of the same tribe, bigger tribe. And we hold each other steady. This is, this is how grace works uh, the anointings, and I didn't mean to go into this, as, a, as, a, as an apostle can draw up an anointing because of their purity and holiness and love for the Lord, love for the Lord's people, because of their deep prayer lives, not because of a name, apostle. It's because of the commitment to a lifestyle as a lover of God, sacrificial. They then draw up a substantial anointing. Do you know a father can do that in a home? A mother can do it in a home. And they draw up that grace, and the grace they draw up holds their family steady. Somebody say, wow. They do it by their prayer life. They do it by their purity, which is why the devil wants you to have mixture. I've said it two or three times this weekend. To a people without mixture, he will give the spirit without measure. Amen. So powerful. When I started to see this, I was like, Lord, I want to be the holiest man on the earth. If I can hold my natural children steady because of the grace I live in, by my prayer life and by my purity and by the anointing you have given me, I want to make sure I don't allow mixture in. I want to walk in that grace. I want to be able to decree over those children's lives. We've got a grandchild coming. I want to pray that grandchild into their destiny. And so can it be in a church or a group of churches. 
as we grow in the anointing, uh, even as a leadership team, you can hold things steady and stop the working of the enemy and cause the grace of God to flow. I want to say just for a moment, fathers, understand the high calling that you've been given, the privilege of providing covering men and women, who we are in Normanton, in Derby, as we do this together, we draw on the grace and the strength of God, and we provide the salt and the light, the God flavors and God colors for Derby, Amen. along with the other churches, but you get what I mean. Yeah. We move from just attending a building to realizing we are ambassadors of Christ. Amen. Hallelujah. We are holy ones, burning ones. We hold nations steady. We turn the spiritual tide. Anybody see that big story that God's unfolding? I'm trying to invite you into that and say, you are more than just a human. Yeah. Having a cup of tea at Chaiwala. I really like that, by the way. I'm like, hmm, we need one of them in Wolverhampton. <laughs> you are a person in whom the Spirit of God dwells. And if you could only see his big story, your powerful short story, fitting inside of your community story, everything could be transformed. Yeah. We're no longer just people who attend a building. We become people on a mission, just like and when you wake up at 5 a.m. And, pr and you pray for an hour, you are changing not only your life, but the life of everybody connected to you. When you make the decision, I'm not going to turn the television on tonight. I know the cycle that does for me. I end up watching the wrong stuff. I go to bed tired. I wake up depressed. Well, I'm going to turn that off. I'm going to ask you to give me sweet sleep and take an early night. And I'm going to ask you, would you in the morning as I'm deciding to meet with you, help me to see who you've called me to be. From You know, the Apostle Paul was in a prison unable to travel or preach, and he spent his time writing letters and praying. And in writing letters and praying, he had no accusation, he had no bitterness, he wasn't saying to God, I served you so well and now I'm in prison. He just realized, Lord, if this is my story right now, I'm going to become the best prayer, I'm going to write the best letters to those churches. I am in the pain of childbirth until Christ is formed in them. I'm travailing and prevailing. And he used his final years in the place of prayer, shifting things. And he was holding open spiritual realms for churches to be planted, for believers to live their lives. This is your story. You can do this in Derby. You can do it for a street. You can do it for a neighborhood. You can do it for a school. You can do it for your marriage. Don't give up on your marriage. Learn the power of praying that marriage into the fruitfulness it should be. We've got too many people whose roots just don't go deep enough and they don't realize who they are. You have a story in God that can transform the world around you. Hallelujah. I think I'm doing better than you and I'm fighting. Okay, let's draw this to a close. I... Here's my, my application. So I've been telling you something about the big thing God's going to do. I'm trying to help you to understand that you have a part to play in that. And I would simply say one of the things, you start asking God, show me my story. Show me their story. Show me your big story. You keep praying that repeating prayer. I, I have no problem praying the same prayer 30 times in a day for like a year. So, little free bit of information. Some of the most powerful prayer lives, I believe in the one or two or three hours, but how about 30, 50, 15 second prayers a day? Did you know how powerful they are? Lord, would you open my eyes? I want to see what you see. How long did that take? Like five seconds? How about praying that 50 times in a day? You're in the car, Lord, open my eyes. Help me to see my wife like you see her. Lord, open my eyes. Help me to see my son like you see him. Help me to feel the emotion over those children like you see them. Lord, would you open my eyes and help me to see Darby like you see him. 
Lord, would you open my eyes and in the midst of a war going on and shortages of food, and would you help me to see the world like you see it? Would you help me to feel your burden, to feel your hope? I'm, I'm just saying, you're walking into the gym, if you go to the gym, you're walking into chicken chili wing things. Chili flame. Chili flame, there you go. Or, and you just pray that prayer. But you pray it in faith and you're asking the Father, I'll guarantee those prayers will be answered. Yeah. What are you doing? You're asking, you're seeking, you're knocking. Lord, would you open my neighbor's eyes? Lord, this street that I live on, would you awaken them to the glory of God? Would you remove the darkness and would you cause light to come into this street? Those powerful 10-second prayers, I'm telling you, when you pray them 40 times a day or 50 times a day, when you pray for your children that way, when you pray for your own mind that way, it's, it becomes a repetitive knocking, asking, seeking, and the Lord says, if you ask like that, I'll answer you. If you seek like that, you will find. If you're knocking on the door, it will be open to you. Yeah. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. We need to learn this consistent pursuit after the Lord. So Revelation chapter 4. Here we go. The problem is, I, I'm, well, you're just good at listening. <laughs> Revelation chapter 4, after this I looked and there before me was a door standing open in heaven and the voice I had first heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, come up here and I'll show you what must take place after this. At once I was in the spirit and there before me was a throne in heaven with someone sitting on it. And the one who sat there had the appearance of jasper and ruby, a rainbow that shone like an emerald encircled the throne. Surrounding the throne were 24 other thrones. Seated on them were 24 elders. They were dressed in white and had crowns of gold on their heads. From the throne came flashes of lightning, rumblings, and peals of thunder. In front of the throne, seven lamps were burning. These are the seven spirits of God. Also in front of the throne, there was what looked like a sea of glass, clear as crystal. I could read the whole chapter. Listen to these phrases. After this, I looked. I want to ask you a question. Where are you looking? With everything I've been saying, where are you looking? And there before me was a door standing open. If you would look at the right direction... Right now, there is a door standing open, and there is an invitation, a voice. It's the voice of the Lord for you right now. It's coming through my preaching, and it comes like a trumpet, and it says, come up here, and I will show you what must take place. And at once, I was in the spirit. I, I want to just, I believe the Lord is calling his church to stop looking everywhere. And to have their eyes fixed on the Lord. We've never been a more distracted. Thank you for that timely tone. That helps me. Oh, it's really helpful. Really helpful. We have never been more distracted as a generation. Is what I was just about to say. <laughs> so we look this way. We look that way. We look over here. We'd, and the Lord is saying, fix your eyes on Jesus. Yeah. And you will see that there is a door standing open. I'm 48 years old. My whole life I've lived with promise. I cannot tell you how excited I am to be alive at this time. I'm not saying how excited I am because my life is exciting or my life is easy. In fact, I would say I've never had a more challenging two-year period in my life. And it doesn't seem like it's going to calm down anytime soon. It's more challenging. It's more awkward. There's difficult decisions to make, but I know we are right in the brink of a, of, a, of a reforming of our lives and a reshaping of our churches. That's why it's awkward. Do you know the glorious moments we read about in history books, we normally gloss over the difficult decisions, the awkwardness of people going against the culture of the day. We just move straight to the glory. We think, isn't that amazing? Wesley preached to 10,000 people. 
And I'm like, it is amazing, but is, isn't it crazy that he got kicked out of hundreds of churches that wouldn't want him to preach before he ever got to the 10,000? Yeah. And he stayed steady because he could see something other people couldn't see. Yeah. Why? Because he came up here. Yeah. He heard a voice. He was looking in the right direction. He saw an opportunity. And he made the Lord his focus, and then the Lord sustained him to walk into what he had. Do you know the passage I read? There is a literal throne room right now in heaven burning like that. It's like our headquarters. It's crazy. If you read through into Revelation 5, there are bowls, and every prayer of every saint is captured in those bowls. The Lord hears them all. I mean, that place is more real than right now. The chair you're sitting on, the person you're next to. There are living creatures, four of them with eyes all over them, a hundred feet tall, crying, holy, 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 holy. There are seraphim and cherubim. The Holy Spirit is seven fires, lamps burning before the throne. And it's not just up there. He comes and those seven fires... They're inside of me right now. Isaiah 11 verse 2 calls them the spirit of the Lord, the spirit of wisdom, the spirit of understanding, the spirit of counsel, the spirit of might, the spirit of knowledge, and the spirit of the fear of the Lord. They are the seven fires burning before the throne. And if you are full of the Holy Spirit, he is the fire burning inside of you. Our God is a consuming fire. Hebrews 12. Did not our hearts burn within us while he spoke to us along the way? Most of us have not been burning. We've maybe just been churning. I was just looking for something to rhyme. I don't know if that makes sense. But Stand up on your feet with me. I want to pray with you. I, 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 there's so much in my notes, but let's just go with what the Lord's saying. If, if you know, Father, I know. Really, what am I doing? I'm saying come up. Come up to this place. Find a way of living in the spirit. Pray those 15-second prayers, uh, uh, you know, 40 times a day. Fill me with your spirit. You said you would give me a baptism of fire. I don't want to just speak in tongues and feel nice feelings. I want a baptism of fire. The Lord loves tenacity in his people. Open my eyes and help me to see. And Father, I want to pray over our church family here today. I thank you for this divine relationship between myself and Pastor Henry, Esther, and uh, Pastor Rachel. I want to thank you for the way you've connected our storylines. And Father, I ask you today for anybody and everybody who's hungry, there's an invitation to come up and to see what the Father is doing, to be in awe of who He is, and to have our hearts set on fire. And Father, I pray for a fresh outpouring of the Holy Spirit upon your people today. As we stood before you, we say we are hungry, we are thirsty, and you promised bread for the hungry, water for the thirsty. We come to you, Jesus, the living bread, the living water, And Father, I pray that fire begin to burn inside of your people today. I pray that the consuming fire of the Spirit would come upon them. I pray even as people sleep this evening, that they would, as they're lying in their beds, that they would have an encounter with the Holy Spirit. They would be awakened to His presence. I pray for dreams, trances, visions, encounters, angelic visitations. Everything we read in the book of Acts, I pray that it would begin to manifest in the new life family, in Jesus' name. Father, remove all mixture. We don't want to have a love affair with the world. We want to be wholly yours. Give us a desire for purity. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen, amen. 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 I'm going to hand back in just a second to Pastor Henry. Your last opportunity to get a hold of these books. This one's called Burning Ones. It's all about igniting and fueling a passion for Jesus. 
This is called Rouse the Warriors. It's a prophetic call to boldly advance the kingdom of God. And I, lots of practical wisdom, how to be a part of the end time army. I talk about characteristics of the end time army, how to get healed if you've been wounded. Two chapters on how to build strong your inner man. And then there's a devotional, 40 days to reignite your fire for Jesus. It's been an absolute joy to be with you the last uh, few days. We love your pastors, absolutely love them. Love their courage and their faith and their obedience to what the Lord is doing. You're on a beautiful journey. And I encourage you, like Paul said to the church at Ephesus in Ephesians 4, he said, as a prisoner for the Lord then, I urge you, live a life worthy of your calling. Be completely humble, gentle. Uh, protect the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Watch out for one another. Be careful what comes out of your mouth. Don't live your life in offense. I, I am about to hand over, but there's two great ministries on the earth. There's the ministry of accusation and the ministry of intercession. Do you know what Revelation 12 says about the devil? He forever lives to accuse us before God. He's constantly bringing a charge against you and me. Did you see what they did? Did you see what they didn't do? Did you see the way that they spoke? He's accusing the brethren before God. It's a ministry of accusation that the devil has. It wants to tear down, pull down. Do you know what the Bible says about what Jesus is doing? He forever lives to intercede. He would say, Father, don't pay attention to that. They're covered by my blood. I've called them. I've chosen them. They're going to make it. I pray for strength for them today. He's interceding. He sees the weakness, but instead of accusing, he intercedes. It's what he did on the cross. Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they are doing. And every person on the earth has a choice. Do we take up accusation? Or will we take up intercession? Will we align with what the enemy is doing? Or will we align with what Jesus does? Watch this. Jesus is on the cross and they accuse him. You said you were the son of man, son of God. You said you were going to. You said, spat at him. What did he do? He absorbed their accusation. It died in him. An intercession rose. Father, forgive them. Wow. Every time you do that, you grow in authority. Every time you suffer injustice and you respond like Jesus, he gives you grace. He says, that was a godly response. Let me give you some power in its place. Let me give you some authority because you're like me. That's the journey to this transformation and I'm like, Lord, I do not want to be like the devil, accusing, harboring, judgmental. I want to be like Jesus, yeah. overlooking, believing the best, raising up an intercession to the Father for them. That was for free. Hadn't planned that. Just felt the Holy Spirit prompt me with that.